There are two selves. The first is conditioned. It's a type structure. In childhood, we all developed one. The child is born relatively free of type. You have, neurobiologically, a predisposition to be a type. Whether it's a head-based, a heart-based, or a body-based type of person, there's strong evidence now that you're born into one of those triads with a dominant theme of how you perceive the world. But life goes on, and whatever one of your centers is accentuated at birth, you interface with the environment and with other people. And out of necessity, out of socialization necessity, you learn to accommodate yourself, behave in such a way that you'll receive love and approval, respect from the people around you. And so the type comes into being with a very strong bias to behave in a certain way and a very strong feeling of insecurity if you get it wrong. So the type is largely a conditioned matter, psychologically conditioned matter. And that's the basis, the foundation from which all development comes, whether it's insight, psychological understanding about yourself, or spiritual experience. Because the type structure is such that when your particular focus of attention is engaged, when your bias is engaged and you feel insecure inside, all subcortically down at the base spinal level you have a reaction which sets off a strong focus of attention to defend yourself against feeling insecure in the hands of other people. And that focus of attention pre-sorts out of billions of bits of data supplied to your senses. The focus of attention neatly packages and sorts in a marvelous, sophisticated manner so that you're looking at a bias, a point of view, and you don't know it. When the type is not engaged, you have a pretty good field of perception about what's going on. You're not threatened inside, and so your autonomic defenses have not been engaged. But then the pressure comes on. Somebody looks at you wrong. You got it wrong. This insecurity defense system, which is very sophisticated, will organize reality as it actually is occurring. Objective reality out there will organize it into a biased subjective reality and you don't know you're caught in a box. You think you're playing with a full deck, <laughs> when actually you're looking at a partial view. I very much like Ken's understanding that all views are correct, but only partially so. It verifies these nine points of view as each correct subjectively. And when you have enough concern or attention about somebody else, you really want to know how they see the world and how they see yourself. It's important in relationship. And it's important in a relationship with spiritual practice to know that simply going into the unknown makes you insecure at some level. And so this guard goes up. And just as if in a relationship that matters, you want so much to get it right that you go on automatic and you get it all wrong. The same thing happens in spiritual practice. And just to finalize this didactic part of the Enneagram as I understand it, the material was not developed originally as a psychological system, although it is one of the most astute psychologies I've ever experienced. It's for the normal and the high-functioning person. It is not seen through the eyes of pathology. It is seen through the eyes of people who need a real good map in order to grow. But it was not developed as understanding your focus of attention and how that sets off your neural pathways in an automatic way and how you're seeing a bias or a view in someone whom you dearly love, perhaps, 
but you can't see them clearly anymore as they are to themselves because you've got your guard up and you don't know it. The same thing happens in spiritual practice and this was a historic tradition. This began long ago, but the first real good record that we have of it is in the fourth century in a monastic community where men and women committed to practice had one living question, what stands between me and received experience? And they came up with the brilliant answer, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> they were working on prior models, but that's not our topic. Although I'm delighted to go there, I would deviate in a moment, but we're not going there. <laughs> It's very rich to understand that this isn't nine people sitting around a kitchen table making up stories about things, but that this has a solid history in antiquity, but it's not our topic, and I will not <laughs> go there. <laughs> Where I will go is to the fourth century, because this was the codification of what came down in tradition as the seven deadly sins. Seven were retained. Two were forgotten over time, but they've been retrieved through historical research, and I will not go there. <laughs> I feel my mind just, you know. <laughs> Hold fast. Right. My students know me very well. In the desert tradition, with the living question, what stands between me and received spiritual experience? These patterns of conditioned mind were detected by interview. Through the agency of a brilliant, a brilliant man, Evagrius of the desert tradition, a monastic who operated very much like an interviewer in a certain way, would go from cell to cell, from isolated hut to isolated hut in the North Egyptian desert under very difficult living circumstances. And he would interview people over time, like a natural scientist would do, and made lists of their descriptions of their impedance to spiritual meditation and prayer. The monk of sleepy mind, the monk of fearful mind. Of course, I think that's the right point of view. You know, <laughs> the, the, the rest of you are massively mistaken. <laughs> But he made the lists and he codified, filled in the map that had its prior existence in time. And what we have today in the narrative tradition is a sort of a revival, you might say, of the interview method where you have to look at yourself internally, reflect upon your own condition in order to be able to come up with the response that will be of assistance to you in relaxing your resistance to receive spiritual experience. That was their agenda. And if you'd bring your attention inward, please. <coughs> the first spiritual question, which many of you will recognize, is where are you? Where are you inside? Where is your attention laid? Where do you place your attention out of automatic habit that you don't even know that as your attention is placed on one significant part of reality, the other significant parts simply fade away? And we are convinced subjectively that our one-ninth view of reality is so and everything else is mistaken. Can you bring your attention inward and place your attention inside yourself? It's an inside job. All of spiritual preparation is an inside job. No one can do it for you. Can you place your attention now outside of yourself, in the middle of the room? With your eyes either open or closed, I prefer to close them, it's less distracting, but with your eyes wide open, can you place your attention in the middle of the room, against the far wall? 
book reading distance and inside of yourself. How do you know this? How do you recognize the placements of attention in space? Once more, please. Middle of the room. Against the far wall. Book reading distance. And inside of yourself. And now with your eyes closed. Against the far wall. Placement of attention. Focus of attention. Neutral. Book reading distance and inside of yourself. In a very few categories of attention, you can cover the whole territory of the type structure that is conditioned. The whole personality type can be included in very few shifts of attention internally. So the first placement of attention is to get inside. And to be able to stay long enough inside that you don't distract and go outside again. Can you focus your attention on your thoughts? Category one. Thinking. Primary category. We use it a lot. And it makes you absolutely unique out of billions of others. If somebody tells you, I cannot be typed, I am unique, they're telling you the truth. Our thoughts are conditioned in the same way as other people who share our type, with a focus of attention. But I have a unique personal story. And the stories never repeat. And it's important to know your story and to treasure that because it's brought you this far. But the spiritual journey requires the relaxation of the story. The story is the work of psychology to detect the focus of attention and the type of person that you are so that psychological interventions are going to make some, make some sense, will be effective. But the spiritual dimension, the other aspect of yourself, is entirely free of conditioned categories of mind. Thinking is category one. Go there and just think, as you might do walking down the street. Your thoughts are your own and will always be so. Can you shift to a memory, something in your own past, Land, place your attention, land your attention somewhere in the past and stick with the memory as it emerges. Where were you? Were you alone or with other people? How old were you at the time? Anything that will keep the object stable inside, that will improve your focus of attention on a specific object of attention, the memory in this case, is part of the process. Being able to stay with one thing at a time. The memory is your own. Can you shift now to a plan, something in the future, something that will happen next week, next month, and go there? Same process, when you land on a plan, stick with it by making it interesting. Are you alone or are you traveling or are you at home? Is someone else with you? All of that will fill in and keep your attention stabilized on the object that you are observing. Category four a very large category, imagination. Can you imagine a pleasant place where you like to go and spend time? Land on it. 
pleasant place, familiar. Look around yourself. Imagination, mental. Can you see yourself there? Are there objects? Is it a study? Are you indoors or outside? Is it a place where you like to go read? Is it a place you like to walk? Where are you? And go there as much as you can in your imagination. Can you tell the time of day by the light and shadow? Imagination of the heart. Can you let your emotions, category five, enter the picture? Emotional state is huge in understanding who you are. Everything is driven by imagination and by emotion. If you were really there right now, what would you be feeling? And let that flood into the impression. And down inside your body, can you feel your sensations in the pleasant place? Probably relaxed, probably feeling okay inside. Can you feel the sensations as you walk in this place? Can you stand and walk in this place? One foot in your imagination, the other. Can you imagine yourself walking and your emotionations are there and your sense of the place, familiar looking place is there, installed in the imagination. Where are you? And none of this is unfamiliar. What may be unfamiliar to you is the mechanics, the miraculous mechanics of what you can accomplish all inside of yourself. Not the spiritual experience that we seek, but the mechanics of awareness that allow us to be receptive enough to the experience that arises all on its own and can only be received. It is not a product of the conditioned nature. Very gently, if you'd open your eyes again, the mechanics of attention internally are such that these categories which you've reviewed and which make up your personality structure are entirely familiar to you. But from the perspective of the inner witness, which is largely hidden, although activated, if you can move your attention from place to place inside and know where you are, and recognize the feedback coming from the objects where you have placed your attention, you are in the business of transformation, but might not know it. 